Hey, just like that, we are live. Hello there. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This afternoon. I hope you've got a pot of tea or a bowl of noodles or a toasted sandwich or a bottle of water or whatever it might be. Because um, what we're going to do today, team, is we are going to talk about corporate oppression. And that might seem a little bit fiddly. Or, in fact, if you're not familiar with the area, it might sound a little bit violent if we're talking about oppression. But um, what we're talking about is the conduct of companies and what shareholders can do about it. So let's start off with some housekeeping. Um, team, the talk is going to be in three different uh, parts today. Part one, we're going to talk nuts and bolts, crunchy stuff to do with the law. Um, uh, part two, we are going to work through some examples uh, that have been litigated. And part three, we are going to make some practical suggestions for your practice. As we go, I'd be really grateful for you to make comments, uh, including these lovely ones flowing in now. Chris is saying hi. G'day, Chris. Bronwyn's waving, hello wave. I've got LinkedIn user, which is a good name for a LinkedIn user who's done a little a uh, little hot drink uh, emoji, which I'm grateful for. Nick Zreika. Nick, thanks for joining the fun. Uh, and uh, Chris, glad you're happy with the topic. So, um, oh, and we've got Hugh as well. Hugh and I work together. Oh, and Hassan. Oh, okay. I should stop reading these lovely comments or I'll be here all day with thanks to, um, thanks to you very, very kind people. Nick, delighted this one will compliment your studies. Okay, we are, I'm going to have another sip of tea, actually. That was all a bit overwhelming and I need to calm down. We're talking about corporate oppression. And team, why does it matter? Why are we having this discussion? Why do I say that it is a useful thing to talk about? Well, uh, because an oppression suit, g'day Halil, g'day Damien, good to see you guys. <laughs> it's so nice to have these comments, but guys, I shouldn't get distracted, I'm sorry. Um, the reason I say it's important is because the nature of an oppression suit can itself threaten a company's very existence. If a company is the unsuccessful defendant in oppression proceedings, it can be wound up. So it's important stuff to understand if you're acting for shareholders on one hand or if you're acting for corporate clients on the other. Uh, so um, because a company can engage in essentially an unlimited range of conduct, uh, as many of you know, uh, or some of you would feel uh, if you don't have direct knowledge, um, a company can do almost every single thing that a natural person, a, uh, a thing of flesh and bone can do. So that means because of this unlimited range of possible conduct, there is uh, some of that conduct that can be commercially unfair to shareholders. And I'll raise my eyebrows when I say commercially unfair because commercial unfairness is going to be a theme we come back to. Uh, I'm loving these comments, team. Nick, delighted you're studying this at uni. Halil, hello. Damien, what's up? Uh, Mina, hello. Uh, Lawrence, I'm sorry to be making you feel oppressed already. All right. This is the oppressive part of the paper. Right now, we're going to dive into the crunchy bit. We're going to talk law. It's going to be a bit technical, but my job is to hopefully help you understand it a little bit. So let's see how we go with that. Right. Um, we're heading to Section 232 of the Corporations Act. And corporate oppression concerns conduct involving commercial unfairness or a departure from a standard of reasonableness which a commercial bystander would consider fair dealing, right? These are all slightly amorphous terms, and that's why we're going to talk some examples later. But I want to have planted in your head that oppression is about unfairness in the eyes of this commercial bystander who's watching the conduct. And there can be all different sorts of descriptions, as we've just learned. There's a very useful ju uh, judgment of Justice Young um, that many courts have turned back to, uh, Morgan and 45 FLARS, 1986 decision, um, where he said that um, the nature, where his honour said that the nature of corporate oppression can be described in any number of different ways, but it all comes back to this fundamental point of commercial unfairness. 
And if you're sitting around scratching your head about, well, what is commercial unfairness? That's fine. We're going to figure it out together. And the first place we're going to start is Section 232. And Section 232 of the Corporations Act is what we might call a jurisdictional section. And what that section says in really, really short form is if there has been commercial unfairness, this term we're going to come back to, then the court can make a 233 order. All right. So let's linger on that if there's been commercial unfairness. That section, um, that section 232 element, and let's dive into it. Um, section 232 um, says that um, the court may make an order if the commercial unfairness test is met. So there's a discretion. So if the court finds there's commercial unfairness, the court may make an order. It isn't that the court must make an order. So there's a distinction there. Another thing to bear in mind is that there are no limitations as to time when that commercially unfair conduct could have happened. It might have been the past. It might be going on now. Or it might even be a contemplated act in future. So there's no limitation on when this oppressive conduct can occur. And then finally, what I'll invite you to take from this quick review, and I'm being quick because I want to get through all of this and then give us all an early mark so we can get out of here, um, is that conduct can be oppressive to the entire membership. When we use the word member in this context, it's very, very similar to shareholder. It's not exactly the same, but basically when I say member, you can take it that I'm saying shareholder. So conduct can be oppressive to the whole of the membership, so 100% of shareholders. It can be commercially unfair to 51%, 50%, 49%, 49% to 1%. So often what we say about corporate oppression is, oh, yeah, yeah, minority shareholders. And yes, that's true. It's a very useful tool for the minority to use when they are pressing their interests. But it can also be used not just by a small minority, it can be used by a large minority, it can be used by a slight majority, it can be used by the entirety. Any proportion of membership is appropriate and has standing to launch an oppression claim. So... Section 232, if there's commercial unfairness, past, present, future, that affects one member, some members, all members, then the court may make a 233 order. And so what is Section 233 all about? Thank you for all these comments. Mina, you are going off in the comments here. So if there's enough, so Mina asks, if there is enough evidence brought before the court, the court can still decide that it is not oppressive. Yes, that's right, Mina. So if I can reframe that slightly, it is an evidentiary question. So if you're someone who says, hey, the company has been oppressive to me, well, what the court says is show me evidence of that. So that's right. You still need to marshal your evidence to prove that. So if I can take us back to Section 232, if there's been commercial unfairness, past, present, future, to one, some, all shareholders, the court may make a 233 order. So let's talk about Section 233. Now, 233 orders can be all sorts of things. We can amend a company's constitution, get into the very foundational document. Uh, sorry, I'm getting emails here. I'll just turn that off. It's probably not as important as you guys. Why don't we check to make sure? Yeah, that's that's fine. That can wait, guys. I'll get to that. Um, although it will distract me for the next few minutes, so forgive me if I'm staring into the distance. I shouldn't have checked. I shouldn't have checked my emails. That's the golden rule. Um, so what sort of things can be the subject of a Section 233 order? Um, well, as I said, the uh, Constitution can be amended. Uh, the company can be ordered to institute, prosecute, defend, or discontinue certain proceedings. A member can be authorised to do a thing on behalf of a company. Uh, a certain person can be required to do a specified act. So there is there a huge range of possible orders that can be made pursuant to Section 233. But what we see in practice, and Nick, I can see your comment there, I'm coming to it. 
um, your question there, I'm coming to it. What we see in practice is that if the court finds commercial unfairness, past, present, future for one, some or all shareholders, then very often the court will almost go into a binary calculus of, right, are we going to do a share sale or are we going to do a wind up? Right. So let's just walk through that one more time. Section 232, if there's commercial unfairness to one, some or all shareholders, past, present, future, the court may make a 233 order. What is a 233 order? It can be anything, or <laughs> that's a bit silly. It can be a huge range of things, but uh, what we find when the rubber hits the road is that it's more or less, is it going to be a share sale or is it going to be a wind up? That's the question. Speaking of questions, Nick in the comments asks, asked, is minority defined anywhere? Oh, not to my knowledge, Nick, but um, Nick suggests a 1%, 2%, 5% of shareholders. Nick, n not to my knowledge and not relevantly for um, not relevantly for uh, Section 232. Uh, and we've got LinkedIn user apologizing for being late. LinkedIn user, all is forgiven for reasons I don't know. I'm not being shown your name, but it's lovely to have your company. Okay. So we've got in our heads this mechanic, 232. If there's unfairness, you can make a 233 order. 232, jurisdiction. 233, a pallet of orders. Yes? Okay. Let's dive in a little more deeply to what can be done. Um, well, we've got a useful judgment uh, called Tamanovich uh, that went to the New South Wales Court of Appeal in 2011. Uh, but at first instance, the judgment of Justice Austin in relation to these elements was undisturbed. So these are still looked on as a really useful um, summary of some of the relevant points for corporate oppression. So let's take a look at them. Um, so the... Oh, it's Beth. Thank you, LinkedIn user, for identifying yourself as Beth. Beth, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining in. Um, okay. Uh, Justice Austin in Tamanovich is telling us that the purpose of the relief, right, the purpose of the 233 order, remember, that can be anything, but it's pretty much share sale or wind up, is to terminate the oppression. So whatever the commercial unfairness is, the purpose of any order is to end that commercial unfairness. That makes sense. Um, unfairness is judged by a commercial bystander who is at at length and removed from the conduct. Um, judges hearing an oppression suit must not remain in their ivory tower. And that might seem a little bit of a weird uh, phrase for his honour to turn back to from the 1990s, but in essence... Uh, what his honour is drawing attention to in this particular judgment is the risk that um, a um, theoretical, uh, to put it gently, or a legalistic view of conduct is taken rather than diving into the real nuts and bolts of what is going on. And so judges must not do that. So that's some useful stuff from Tamanovich. We've got some more lovely comments coming in. Bruce Hall says, congratulations on the new role. Bruce, thank you. This is a good chance to do some branding. I used to work at one firm that was very good and I liked very much, and now I work at a new firm that uh, is very good and I like very much. The new firm is called Chamberlain's. They have comfortable hoodies is one of the one of their great strengths or one of our great strengths, but we've got other great strengths as well. So, Bruce, thank you. Ah, uh, David asked a very good question. Corporate oppression, is this the same as the oppression of a minority shareholder? That's a really good question. David, the short answer is yes. Um, so if we think about minority shareholder oppression, yes, th this is the concept we're dealing with. But if I can add on top of that to slightly repeat myself, oppression can be for a minority shareholding, just one or two, it can be for a big minority, it can be for a majority, or it can be for an entirety. So while we talk about minority oppression, it can actually apply to any proportion between 0 0.1 or, you, you know, a tiny minority up to 100% of the shareholding. So, David, thank you for that excellent question. Halil asks a very good question here. Halil, what do you say? Is it also true that oppression can be manifested in a major departure from the original common intention of members? Short answer is yes. 
um, Halil. And then the longer answer to that is, um, um, yes, if that departure from the original intention is commercially unfair. So not to get not to dive too deeply into a hypothetical, but Halil's excellent question is is taking me there. So it's Halil, it's your fault for asking something so uh, insightful. We might imagine that a shareholders agreement um, is entered into, um, whereby uh, you and me and the walnut tree as shareholders um, agree that our company is going to sell sandwiches. And then someone says, well, let's also run an airline. Um, and depending on how that um, is dealt with, that may be oppressive, that may be a breach of contract, it may be a breach of the shareholders agreement, maybe any number of things, but certainly yes, Halil, to answer your excellent question, um, it may be oppressive. I'm going to pour myself some tea. Hey team, it's so lovely to have your company, I must say. It's so It's been so nice, these, um, these sessions of going live and having a pot of tea and talking about these funny areas of the law that I find interest in and, and, and really enjoying and really grateful for these comments. So do feel free. Um, we're broadcasting live to YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. If you come in late, that's fine. I think you can just scroll back and rewind wherever you're watching this, that's fine. But this will also be up. Um, I think it sticks around, it certainly sticks around on YouTube. I think it sticks around on LinkedIn and I'm certain it sticks around on Facebook too. So if you've come in late, do not worry, do not fret, do not stress. Um, we'll be able to get this one for you. And if not, ping me a message and I'll find it for you. I'll link it up. So that's fine. Okay. We are about to get started. But Chris Loyola has asked a very good question. Chris asks, if I am a shareholder only, am I personally liable if someone sues the company? Chris, no, is a short point. So um, if we're talking about PTY Limited, um, the traditional sort of corporations we deal with, your liability is limited to the price of your shares uh, and you are not going to be personally liable for um, any of the mistakes of the company or any breaches of duties or anything like that um, just by virtue of being a shareholder. Your risk is the extent of your shareholding and no further. I hope that makes sense. And a useful way to think about these is always to use the BHP example. So let's say if I'm a shareholder in BHP and BHP gets sued, is someone coming for me? The answer to that is no. Um, but the, then the answer is, what's my risk? Well, if someone's suing BHP for something really, really bad that BHP has done, such that the value of my share in BHP goes to zero, then my stake in BHP, my share, the value of it has dropped considerably. So that's my risk, is the value of my shareholding. I hope that makes sense. Oh, Chris, Chris is coming with a good question today. Can a director sell my shares without my consent? Ha, 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 ha. Um, the really short answer is no. The longer answer is um, there can be circumstances where a minority shareholder, especially in sort of drag along, tag along clauses that we can talk about if you want to go deep, and that's, and that's good fun, apply in a shareholders agreement. Or if there's a court ordered share sale, um, but as a normal matter of day to day interactions, shares are something you own, and a director represents shareholders, and so cannot just dive in and start start selling shareholders on behalf of others, absent some additional operation of law, some additional contractual agreement or court order or something like that. Man, I like you guys are asking. You guys are asking very good questions. And Nick's made a comment about a case I haven't read, so I should probably go silent on that, Nick, but very, very good of you. So let's get back to um, where we were because I'm having too much fun with your excellent uh, questions. Um, we are in the middle of a talk that has three phases, law, practical examples, and then suggestions for your practice. I just want to round out the law bit because um, if I can refresh your memory, Section 232, if there's commercial unfairness, the court can make a Section 233 order. And uh, in a judgment that we're going to get to from 2017 called Munsterman and Rayward, um, there uh, is a very useful uh, comment made from uh, His Honour Justice Stevenson, uh, useful number of comments that deal with uh, corporate oppression. Thanks for all these lovely comments, dudes. Uh, you're very welcome, Chris. And... 
Nick, I'll need to dive into that a bit more deeply because my brain's moving slower than yours is. Um, so if we linger on what his honour said, um, the test of corporate oppression is one of objective unfairness. So it's one from an objective bystander, commercially minded, taking a look and deciding on the balance of probabilities whether something is unfair. Now, importantly, a director can act in an oppressive way but not be in breach of her or his duties. So she might do something that is oppressive that is nonetheless within the limits of all other relevant laws. So you are able to breach Section 232 commercial unfairness. Unfairness. It does not require illegality. You don't have to breach anything else in order for something to be commercially unfair. Uh I always want to note some things we've really covered. So remember, a 50% shareholder or even a majority shareholder can seek relief in oppression proceedings. Um, and regarding timing, this is the timing point I want to um, be clear with you about because time is marching on and it's going to be relevant to some of the decisions we're going to discuss. Now, the question of timing in relation to liability or what we might say in relation to the Section 232 issues, the timing question that the court asks is, was it commercially unfair at the time proceedings were started? Right? So if I file my uh, originating process today, Chris has asked a really good question that I'll come to. I'll Chris, I'll cover this timing point first. <laughs> thanks, thanks for these great questions. Um, <laughs> If I file my originating process uh, today on whatever today is, 8 September 2020, then the matter finally gets to hearing on 8 September 2023. Then the question the court asks on 8 September 2023 is, was it commercially unfair on 8 September 2020? Okay. So that 232 question about commercial unfairness you prove it on the day you commenced proceedings. You file that document. In relation to 233, what order is appropriate? The answer to that question in relation to timing is at the final hearing. So you answer that on 8 September 2023. Because the aim of those orders, as we learned before, is to cure the oppression. So if we flash forward to 8 September 23, the court might say, oh, yes, that conduct 100% commercially unfair on 8 September 2020. But as we're sitting here on 8 September 2023, everything's fine now. There's no more oppression. And so there's no order to make. And so if I've sued on the basis of that oppression and I don't get my orders, I actually lose. I'm going to go into an example of that shortly. In fact, why don't we... Why don't we go into that example now? Oh, yes, Chris, Chris has asked a good question. Um, uh, can a director dilute my percentage of a company by creating new shares? The answer to that, Chris, is a very lawyery answer. Yes, in some, in a number of circumstances, yes, is the short answer. I'm not going to dive into that any deeply. But I, in addition to my yes, I might say that there are other circumstances where that, where that has been found to be oppressive as well. So while there are some circumstances where what we might refer to as a dilution, speaking weekly, uh, sorry, speaking broadly, um, uh, is okay, there are other circumstances where a dilution can be oppressive. All right. We did well getting through the law team, and you asked some brilliant questions that um, I really enjoyed. I'm just sitting here in my study, which is a complete mess. I've, I've moved the computer so that you can't see too much of the mess, hopefully. Um, but uh, it's great to have your sort of energetic um, questions and comments coming in. So please do keep them coming. They're fantastic. And I'm really grateful. So thank you. Okay. Let's get to our first example. Um, this is a case called Shanahan and Jatese. Uh, and we're going to deal with the first instance decision that was the Supreme Court of New South Wales uh, 2018. Uh, so a company, this corporation, owns and operates an eye hospital. And it owns and operates this eye hospital in Canberra. Uh, and the um, eye hospital in Canberra, um, the shareholders in it are the eye surgeons. And so what these eye surgeons do 
is they go about their um, their jobs day to day. They perform eye surgery. And what they do is generate revenue for the company and then the company uh, distributes that revenue back to those eye surgeons uh, in the form of, speaking loosely, dividends. So they're shareholders, the company makes money and the uh, dividends or that money gets paid back to the shareholders in the form of dividends. So uh, some of the shareholders, some of the eye surgeons retire and they head off to the golf course but they remain shareholders. And so we've got our retired eye surgeons who are playing golf, <laughs> I suppose. That's what you do when you're retired in Canberra, um, is my guess. And they continue to generate an income. They continue to be paid because they're shareholders in this company, right? And the majority continue to work. They're out there performing surgery. They're generating money for the company and half of it's siphoning off to the fairway, right? So the majority as you can imagine, are not extremely impressed with this state of affairs. And what they do is they appoint some directors to the company who are sympathetic to their point of view. And what those directors do is, among other things, they stymie the appointment of a new eye surgeon, right? The company's solvent, but in order to get it back to a real sort of high, juicy operating level, um, what they need is more surgeons, and these directors that the majority have appointed, they sort of really stymie the process of getting a new a new surgeon appointed. What they also do, which is interesting, is to uh, place the company into uh, administration, place it into VA, voluntary administration, by the directors when it was not insolvent and it didn't seem likely to become so. And what the minority on the golf course said was, that's oppressive. So what did they do? They filed their claim. And remember, there's Section 232 where they say that's commercially unfair. Section 233 saying we want some orders. So this claim gets filed in, let's say, 2015. A little while after that, there's a mediation. And if you don't know what a mediation is, it's essentially a sort of structured settlement negotiation. And um, what happens at this structured settlement negotiation, if we're going to accept my made-up definition, <laughs> um, is that the minority, our golf course directors, agree to sell their shares for an amount, let's say the amount about $1.7 million. All right, so they get this agreement. They're going to sell their shares. They're going to get $1.7 million. Fine. Um, they don't agree to end their oppression proceedings. So the oppression proceedings continue to rage on despite the fact they've sold their shares. And so on we march. And do you remember the question we had about timing? The court has taken through all these issues and the court says, well, yes, stymieing the appointment of this new surgeon, that's oppressive. Putting the company into voluntary administration when it was not insolvent and not likely to become so, that's oppressive. And so the court then says, right, we have a discretion. Now that we've found that something's oppressive, we've got a discretion. We can, we may make Section 233 orders. And what the court says is, well, we need to figure out whether there's any current loss, current damage being suffered as a result of this oppression. And what the court does is looks at the value that the golf course directors received for their shares. And what the court finds is that the golf course directors received higher than uh, fair value for their shares, which means that they enjoyed a windfall, which means that notwithstanding the 232 finding that there was oppression, there was no damage or loss arising from that oppression that would form the basis for a 233 order. And so the court didn't make an order. And so our golf course directors who had proved oppression didn't get the orders they wanted, and so they lost, right? And so then there's an argument about costs because normally what happens, as you might know in litigation, is to speak very broadly, the winner gets their costs, right? Costs follow the event. If you win, the other side has to pay at least a proportion of your legal costs. 
Well, here, what the golf course directors say, as you might imagine, is, well, this whole case was basically about was there oppression. We won on that, so we should get our costs. And what the other side said, and what the other side successfully said was, well, no, because don't forget you didn't get any 233 orders and you came here for 233 orders, you went home empty-handed, and so we should get our costs from you, and the court agreed with that finding. And so this case uh, has the rather stern outcome from some, you know, on one view, that despite the fact that a set of parties, a minority, was able to prove oppression, because they didn't get the orders they wanted, they lost. And because they lost, they had to buy the, pay the other side's legal costs. Let's go to our next decision. We're in the Victorian Court of Appeal in 2018. Uh, this, is, this is the decision of, gosh, I should not try to say that too fast next time. This is the decision of Knight's Quest and Daiwa Can. Okay. We have got a an Australian company. And what the Australian company does is manufacture wine. And this is wine of a kind to be stored in a can. Wacko. In about 2012, an agreement is reached whereby a Japanese can manufacturing company purchases a 60% stake in the Australian wine manufacturing company, right? So we've now got a Japanese parent company that owns 60% of the Australian wine company. Now, the Japanese parent company also owns a winemaking subsidiary. And as years pass, um, what happens is the Australian wine manufacturing company doesn't actually perform as well as everyone had hoped. Um, we have a dispute arising between the Australian wine manufacturing company and the Japanese wine manufacturing company, the subsidiary about licensing, about markets in China and about all this crunchy stuff. And what the other 40% shareholders in the Australian company, remember the Japanese company bought 60%, and the Australian uh, holding was the 40% balance, what they say is, right, Japanese company, parent company, you have been oppressive uh, in sort of allowing this uh, subsidiary to compete with the Australian company. That's corporate oppression. That's commercially unfair. And what the court finds is, firstly, can, well, sorry, the court has to answer the question of, well, can you sue a shareholder in corporate oppression? Because remember, when Chris, it was Chris, wasn't it? Chris asked his question before about, well, if I'm a shareholder, am I exposed? And do you remember how we raised the example of BHP? Well, if I'm a shareholder in BHP and BHP does something, am I exposed? Well, I gave Chris the short answer that was an unsophisticated answer. But in this particular case, what the court found was that in some scenarios, a majority shareholder can, in certain circumstances, be pursued in corporate oppression. So they can be defendants in an oppression suit. What happened was that the oppression claim here was not made out because in short, at the time, the Japanese parent company, sorry, it's over here, isn't it? The Japanese parent company uh, bought shares in the Australian wine manufacturer. Everyone pretty much knew the score with the Japanese subsidiary and in essence, what was being complained about was just poor financial performance of the Australian company rather than genuine oppression. I'm saying goodbye to Lawrence. Lawrence, thanks for your company. Good luck in court this afternoon. And um, Lawrence has a great Instagram account called Super Lawyer, I should say, S-U-P-A-L-A-W-Y-E-R. Well worth checking out. Okay, let's stay in Victoria for reasons... No, well, Victoria's a lovely place, I'm sure. Uh, probably not at the moment, but we'll leave that aside. For a, another Supreme Court of Victoria decision uh, called Falkingham and Peninsula Kingswood, uh, this is the decision about uh, two golf clubs. There's a merger. And in essence, one golf club, let's say this one, uh, merges with this golf club. And what do I mean by merge? How does the transaction actually work? Well, this golf club shuts down. It sells its golf course 
Uh, the golf course is valuable real estate. You know, the basis is, hey, we're going to get a property developer to buy it. That'll bring us in some money. And that will mean that um, now this newly merged club is going to be financially stable. Now, just a little bit more on the technicalities. We have the members of this club joining the newly merged club. So these members need to be moved across into the new club. So how is that going to happen? Well, interestingly, the constitution of the company granted the directors of the, pardon me, of the company the power to admit new members. And so what the director said was, oh, yeah, we've got the power to admit new members. Don't worry, we'll bring these members in and that'll make our newly merged club. Great. One member complained and launched oppression proceedings and interestingly proved that the directors had the power to admit new members, but the purpose for that power being granted to them was not to affect a merger, it was for other reasons. And what that meant was that the use of that power for a merger was indeed commercially unfair. It was Section 232 unfair. And so what flowed from that was the uh, disappointed plaintiff saying, well, great, um, <laughs> let's talk about my relief. And what the court says was, well, no, you've been so delayed in bringing these proceedings that we're not we're going we're going to exercise our discretion to order no relief. So we're not going to make any orders. And so, despite the fact that we've proved section two three two, you were too slow to bring your claim. And so, we're going to exercise our discretion to give you no relief. Now, that was the first instance decision. It was appealed. On appeal, what the member did was to add the purchaser because uh, there's now been a purchaser for the old golf course land that used to be here to try to unravel that purchase and what the court said to that was in short no um, to the injunction that the plaintiff was seeking and otherwise affirmed and upheld what was found at first instance um, yes and I've covered that in my all right um how much time have we got? Look, I'm conscious of an early mark. Let's just go through a couple more decisions. And what we might do is, having done that, we won't have that much time for my practical suggestions. So I, I'm sort of getting getting the vibe from these comments here that there's a bit more value in working through our nuts and bolts examples than there isn't practical suggestions. So I'm going to march on that way. And if that's wrong, then uh, it's oppressive to you. My apologies. Okay. Let's head to the Queensland Court of Appeal. A decision called Asia Pacific and Always from 2018. Um, this is an interesting one when we think about Section 232, because what I think I said to you before was um, there's a huge number of 232 remedies, but in essence, the court always comes back to, is it going to be share sale? Is it going to be wind up? Now, this is interesting um, and it's very complicated and I'm not going to dive into the complicatedness. In short, at first instance, the court finds, hey, the appropriate position is that there was corporate oppression. 232 gets a big tick. And so what should happen is a wind up. Now, there is an appeal and what the defendant says is, actually, yeah, we accept that it's commercially unfair. We accept that 232 has been satisfied. We accept that the court should exercise its discretion to grant orders. But we say it should not be a wind-up. It should be a share sale. Now, what the court has to do is to work through some law in relation to a wind-up being seen as a last resort. And so in broad brush strokes, the court has to form a view about whether a wind-up is indeed an actual last resort. It, it, it can only be ordered if every single other possibility has been considered and discounted for some genuine and appropriate reason, or if it is merely an extreme step. 
And the court considers the profound effects a wind-up can have on employees, on shareholders, on creditors, and, and on things like supply chains. You know, you've got these contracts, these, these relationships with external parties. Wind-ups are solemn and serious. But what the court finds is they are not technically an absolute last resort. They are merely an extreme step. And the very short point is that the court affirmed the primary <coughs> judge's decision to order a wind-up uh, and work through uh, some of the relevant points regarding a share sale and said, look, valuation of these shares is actually going to be a really expensive, difficult process because, among other things, the company has an unlitigated claim for 33 million bucks. And if you've got a claim for 33 million bucks that might succeed and might fail, well, how do you value that? It's not an easy task. Um, there were doubts about whether the appellant had enough money to even pay for the shares because, it, look, as you've just learned, it's going to be in the tens of millions of dollars, which is no joke. Um, and um, in theory, there could have been a guarantee for that sum, but uh, because there were some big, serious uh, parent companies hovering behind some of the relevant parties here, and one of those big mummy or big daddy companies might have been able to step in and offer a guarantee, but that isn't what happened, and so there was no guarantee. And so what the court uh, said was that because it's unclear whether the appellant would have been able to perform the buyout order, whether they had the money to buy the shares, um, the court was satisfied that a wind-up rather than a share sale was the right outcome and the appeal was dismissed. Okay. Can I ask, sorry, if anyone's uh, watching on YouTube or Facebook, can you just hit me with a thumbs up emoji just so I can get a bit of a data set? By the way, just as a favor to me. That'd be of assistance. Okay. Um, oh, Nick's just thanked me for that case. Nick, let me give you the citation. Uh, it's 2018, Queensland Court of Appeal 48, Asia Pacific and always, always one word, A-L-L-W-A-Y-S. All right, so let's turn to uh, another decision now. This is Hunter and Organic and Natural, uh, Queensland Court of Appeal 331. We're in 2013. Okay, um, we've got, gosh, look at time. Um, it's got away from me a bit. We've got five individuals. They are operating a company where um, the each are shareholders, and each group, this is a husband and wife group, group, speaking loosely, this is a husband and wife group, and we'll call this little person over here a group as well. They each um, appoint, um, you're welcome, Nick, they each appoint a director to the company. And what the company does is sell products, and that's fine, and it does well, and it makes money and all that sort of thing. Um, time passes, and what the shareholders resolve to do is to do a bit of a restructure, and the restructure is for tax minimization and asset protection purposes. Essentially what happens is this. We've got our trading entity, then we've now got a trustee of a unit trust. The trading entity uh, assigns all of its know-how and all of the way it does its business over to the unit trustee, and the unit trustee licenses this IP back to the trading entity and the trading entity pays license fees over to the unit trustee, just paying out money, pumping out money. This is how we get the profits out of the trading entity and into the unit trust. Now the unit trust beneficiaries are three family trusts. They're one husband and wife trust, another husband and wife trust, and this solo person trust, where are they? They're over here. And so, the money is coming out from, oh gosh, my hands are now getting all over the place. This has got more complicated than I thought. The unit trustee is paying money out, down, down, down to these three family trusts. And that sort of seems pretty tax effective because the trading entity now doesn't own any assets. And so the risks are reduced to a very, very small amount. 
license fees are getting pumped out over to the unit trust. The unit trust is distributing stuff down into all of those family trusts. Fine. Well, uh, fine until the relationship between uh, one husband and wife breaks down and our wife in the family, her entitlement to distributions from this trust is completely dependent upon her remaining married, right? So now that she is getting divorced or whatever family law word there is for it, her entitlement to get money out of this thing, which remember, all the money is pumped out over this way into the unit trust. So the only way she can get money out is that it gets pumped out of here into the unit trust down into the family trusts. And now that she's no longer going to be in a relationship, she's got no way of getting money out of here. So she's a shareholder. Remember back at the start, we she's one of the five shareholders in this thing. And it is sort of the engine, as it were, of a successful business. But now her shares in it are worth almost nothing because this thing owns no assets. That makes sense? And she says, oppression. What the court says is, no. The reason for that is quite specific. And that is... Firstly, well, this isn't quite a reason, but this is relevant background. She entered into this arrangement with all the trusts and that sort of thing with her eyes open. So she took advice, accepted advice, signed documents and approved of the whole thing. Um, but secondly, um, the nature of corporate oppression is such that, sorry, I'm sliding away, is such that um, it must be commercially unfair conduct. And what she's complaining about is an outcome. She's saying, hey, at the end of all this, I don't get the money that I should have had because I'm a shareholder in this. And what the court said is, well, you can't point to any conduct that is unfair and you haven't pointed to any conduct that is unfair. And so there's nothing from any Section 233 order to attach to. And so you are left without a remedy. And indeed she was. And um, for anyone who sees that as a bit of a sharp outcome um, the disappointed plaintiff was left with her uh, claim to bring in uh, family law proceedings, which I understand she went on to do. Okay. Look, I had in mind an early mark. Um, team, I was going to try to get you out of here by 10 2. So I might take you through just one more case real quick, and then we can all head for the exits and get back to our day. Um, I'm really grateful for your company, though, I should say as well. I'm having a great time reading these comments, and it's, um, it's really invigorating and really good fun. So thank you for all of those. Okay. Uh, this, is a, this is a decision. This is a decision called Munsterman and Raywood. Uh, we've got a company that carries on business in Queensland. It has two directors. Each of those directors is a 50-50 shareholder in the company. One director is a managing director in their on the tools, doing the day-to-day -day work. The other director is back in Sydney, uh, not really contributing to the company. Now, uh, the subtext is that our Sydney director attempted to sell his shares uh, in previous years, and the Queensland director said, no, I'm not going to buy them. Or perhaps more accurately, I'm not going to buy them at that price. Okay. Um, an irreconcilable deadlock arose. Uh, and the uh, Sydney director did a number of curious things that I'm going to take you through now. The Sydney director attempted to be reinstated as financial controller when there were existing employees who were already performing that role. Um, and uh, due to ill health, the defendant wouldn't be able to do it anyway. <laughs> so it's slightly bizarre. Uh, the defendant issues an invoice to the company for 16 grand when the evidence showed no work had been done, and indeed no work had actually been requested. Uh, the defendant set himself an unjustified salary, uh, required that all payments for minor items, even staples, had to be approved at minuted directors' meetings, I sent an all-staff email saying that the company didn't have enough money to pay wages and super when that was wrong. Uh, and generally, and this is something he accepted in cross-examination, uh, held the company at ransom so he could get what he wanted. And the court, unsurprisingly, perhaps found this conduct to be commercially unfair and 
as a result, uh, made um, orders for uh, Section 233 relief, and those orders were for a share sale. And what you might say is, well, isn't that what Sydney Director wanted to start with? And the answer to that is, yeah, maybe, but probably not at a fair value with respect. Okay, that's the final example. Um, Bruce, thank you for that kind comment, which I really appreciate. Thank you all for your comments. It's fantastic. Let me dive quickly into some practical suggestions and then I will get out of your way, I promise. But practically, um, I think I can do this really, really, really quickly. Practically, if there is conduct that you consider may well be oppressive, then your options are very, very limited. They are, in short, agree or litigate. If you want to litigate um, all the usual things, you want to keep good records, you want to go and get some advice early on, you want to make sure that you are clear on what you're doing. If you want to agree, uh, it's important that you turn your attention to the shareholders agreement. Now, when's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the best time to draft a shareholders agreement? 20 years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Today. Second best time for a shareholders agreement? Today. So if at all possible, um, if you see issues like this, you want to bang them on the head. I'm a litigator. I'm a court lawyer. I love running these things and they are expensive to run. And they are, with the greatest of respect to me and to my opponents and colleagues, um, they are not necessarily the cheapest or most uh, commercially uh, advantageous sets of litigation to run. So if there's an if there's a deal to be done, do that deal is the practical suggestion boiled down to its very heart. And if there's not, and you need to knuckle up, then that's another issue, and you know uh, <laughs> you know who to call. And so, team. That's as far as I was planning to take it today. I'm really grateful for your company. I've been doing these LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook sessions at lunchtime on a Tuesday for a number of weeks now at 1 p.m. I've got one last session at 1 p.m. next week. Hope you'll join me. Um, that's going to be about sort of professionals and personal branding. They'll be talking you through my strategy of how I'm using the internet to build a practice. Uh, and so uh, if you want to come along next week, 1 p.m., same place, wherever you're watching this, um, then uh, very, very happy to do that. And that'll also be a good time for questions as well. I've tried to be pretty good with questions, but I think I might have missed a couple today. But aside from that, and if you don't have any questions now, I'm going to have one more sip of tea, uh, and then I'll get out of your hair. So thank you all for your time. Thank you especially for your comments, which I really appreciate, and your questions. And I will look forward to speaking with you again, perhaps next week. Thank you.